Some time ago, we looked at games that made fun of you for trying so hard, and our self-esteem has taken this long to recover. So we're doing it again. Wait, hang on, we're doing it again? Because we didn't count on you, the collective commenters, being able to think of so many more hilarious instances of games mocking your efforts, making us wonder why we bothered, frankly. Seriously, if one more game tells me to go outside, well, frankly, I just might. Oh, who am I kidding? That's an empty threat. Anyway, beware spoilers and vicious mockery from the following games. Devil May Cry 4 is a game with a misleading title because it suggests there may be crying involved, whereas actually you will definitely cry, either at the perfect anime fluffiness of Dante's hair or the game's difficulty, which in keeping with the series is fairly ruthless, especially on higher difficulties. It's a game as hard as its protagonist's hair is soft. You brought this here for me? I will move on from this hair thing, but seriously, have you seen that? And does anyone know what conditioner he uses? One of the game's most brutal difficulty modes is called Son of Sparta, and if you manage to beat it, your thumbs will basically be dust, and you will have unlocked Heaven and Hell mode. In this mode, every attack in the game does maximum damage, so enemies and bosses die in just one hit, but so do you, meaning just a few unlucky stray shots could easily end an otherwise perfect playthrough in moments. <laughs> And if you beat it, well, you might not want to bother, as commenter Justin Sekula recalls. I believe it was heaven or hell mode in DMC4 that, when I beat it, I was told I must not have a social life. Indeed, completing this mode takes an ungodly amount of time, no pun intended. And is Devil May Cry 4 impressed when you do? The answer is an emphatic no, because should you complete heaven and hell mode, your reward is a JPEG of some of the female cast posed suggestively, along with the text, man, you need to get out more a backboard shattering dunk on you from the game developers for having the nerve to like playing their game a whole lot. Well, Devil May Cry 4, your wish is granted. I'm leaving, with my dignity and my pages and pages of Dante fan art. Uh. Saints Row 4 is not known for its subtlety or its realism. So when they brought out the Christmas DLC, How the Saints Save Christmas, where you had to help out an actual saint, jolly old Saint Nick, from an evil enemy known as Claws with a W, most players didn't bat an eye. Claws is going after the North Pole and we have to stop it. But they did GAT an eye. Okay, that worked better in my head. There's a Saints member called Johnny GAT. Let's move on. In this DLC, upon reaching Santa's workshop at the North Pole, you find it barred with candy canes in an effort to keep out Big Bad Claws. Hmm, Mary has enacted emergency shutdown. And you're given two options. Ignore the door and take an alternate route via the stables, or you can lick your way through the candy cane bars like you're trying to escape some kind of gingerbread house Alcatraz. I mean, surely you could just lift them out of the sockets? But hey, guess which one we chose. <laughs> <laughs> what follows is what can generously be called a mini-game, where you have to mash Y to slobber your way through these sugary defences. <laughs> but turns out it takes a sarcastically long time to do so. <laughs> Great, well we've already committed now. And Saints Row 4 knows players will hate to give up, which is probably why it gleefully takes the piss out of you for trying to get through the bars this way, as pointed out by commenter Dylan Good. The candy cane door from the Saints Row 4 Christmas DLC should definitely be on this list. It mocks you while you're trying, and after you've tried, it continues to mock you. <laughs> Uh. 
Even more off-putting, the whole while you have to listen to your character's overly enthusiastic slurping and hope to God none of your neighbours can hear the game audio through the walls. <laughs> you made the noise game! I just want to go through the door! But Saints Row 4 continues to tease you, from making out like you have a vendetta against candy canes, to accusing you of only doing this task to get an achievement. It even tries to trick you into thinking you'll be there for even longer by telling you you're only halfway there, right near the end, the bastards. But finally, after being ridiculed for mashing a button for over four minutes and God knows how many times, you finally make your way through the candy cane and you'll be rewarded for your persistence. <sighs> Refreshing. Oh, it's locked. Rewarded with a locked door. <laughs> now, excuse me while I go cry in a corner for a few minutes. <laughs> you. You. Me, me, pickle pea. Me, me, bumperum. As you've no doubt noticed, more than a few games mock players for completing their game on high difficulty settings. Well, Dark Souls 3 only has one difficulty setting. Yes, in this game where you are guaranteed to die painfully over and over and over, it would be a little too obvious and a little too cruel for the game to ridicule you for completing it. Besides, Dark Souls players are already questioning exactly why they willingly put themselves through this, they don't need the game to join in. So in this instance, Dark Souls doesn't mock you for trying to complete it, but for trying something bold. Commenter Danky King knows the pain all too well. Trying to exchange some items with the nest of Pickle Pea Pumperum. Sorry, what? In Dark Souls 3, there's a crow called Pickle Pea Pumperum Crow who you can trade items with. The one that carries you off at the start of the game? No, that's the first game. But it looks the same. No, Pickle Pea Pumperum is never seen. She's just an off-camera voice. I'm never playing this game. Sorry about him. Yes, Pickle Pea Pumperum will mysteriously leave you an item if you drop something off at her nest. Pickle Pea. What you get depends on what you drop, and needless to say, there are some pretty rare and important items you can part with in this game. But perhaps none so vital as an undead bone shard, of which there are only ten. These crucial shards increase the health you get back when you use your Estus Flask, so they are extremely precious. And if, like Danky King, you decide to trade one, well, the game thinks that's just hilarious. Back to you, Danky King. Donated an undead bone shard to receive a mediocre shield with a pig's head on it. That would be the Porcine Shield, a comedy item which can only be acquired via this method, and contains a brutal burn in the item description. Shields such as these were made to shame weak-willed knights, and those who carried these shields were subject to merciless ridicule. So now, for your curiosity and willingness to part with a vital item, the game has punished you with a comedy pig's face that singles you out as a coward. Oh, and it doesn't even block that much damage. And this is what you like, is it? You know, I'm coming round to your way of thinking. Everyone knows Sony's most beloved furry mascot. Uh, Crash Bandicoot? Close, but no. Kratos? No, the beard isn't that big. Sackboy? What? No, it's Sly Cooper. Who the f*** is Sly Cooper? This sneaky trash panda is much beloved amongst those who've played his games, thanks to his fun stealth-themed platforming. 
But for all of Sly's encouragement for you to stay out of sight, once you finish the second game, Band of Thieves, its tone definitely changes, as noted by commenter Mitchell Delaney. Sly Cooper 2, I think, had a go-out sideline at the end of the credits reel, which kinda sucked because I was spending the summer at my grandparents' house and Granny saw it, thought that's a great idea, and told me to go outside for an hour. No, Granny! The grandparents are supposed to spoil the children, not make them exercise! Did this Granny not get the memo? Unfortunately, the end of Sly 2 Band of Thieves was shown to her first, where upon completing hours of sneaking about, finishing the game to 100% and dutifully watching the credits, the game encourages you to go outside where other people and daylight are, the total opposite of stealth. Sorry game, but you've been extremely pro darkness and shadows this whole time. Well, unless this outside is some kind of bonus scene? Ah, no, it's just sunlight. They lied. Ah. Who doesn't love a spot of fishing? Oh wow, literally everyone's hands are up. Yet this most famously monotonous of hobbies continues to make its way into video games. For instance, in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, often heralded as the greatest video game ever, even though it contains a fishing minigame. That's how good Ocarina of Time is. The fishing minigame, found near the game's Lake Hylia region, is very much an optional distraction and offers little in the way of earth-shattering rewards. Except that the grumpy man who won't stop scratching himself that runs the place will display your finest catch proudly on the counter for all to see. Moreover, the fishing pond does contain one particularly elusive creature, a lengthy eel-like beast you can occasionally spot lurking in the depths, but only on rare occasions. Unlike the rest of the normal fish, it defies almost all attempts at being hooked, especially because for some reason Link seems determined to catch these fish using a fishing rod, even though that's extremely hard and time consuming, and he has pockets full of bombs and arrows and other weapons that would kill every fish in this pond inside of two seconds. Please Link, can we at least hookshot that one? Those who simply cannot ignore a challenge might be tempted to invest significant time and energy into catching that mysterious fish at the bottom of the pond, for completion's sake or just the thrill of seeing it proudly placed in the tank. The journey is an involved one. First, you'll need to bag a fish big enough to earn a golden scale, which lets you access a randomly spawning sinking lure, which is the simplest way to bag this mystery fish, assuming it's even there, which is only every fourth time you visit the pond. It also has an AI behavior pattern that merits almost 350 words on the Zelda wiki, almost as many words as we've used here. Does catching this fish still seem like something you want to do? Well, before you make a decision, heed the words of commenter Trumpeter Jen. It took four hours, but I finally caught the thing and brought it up to the attendant, who told me it's an endangered Hylian loach. Trumpeter Jen is bang on. This oh-so-rare fish can, with patience and practice, be caught. And if you bring it to the attendant, to have your efforts rewarded with a prominently displayed legendary fish for all of Hyrule to wander at, that's when the game says, thanks for making the effort, idiot, but lol no. Trumpeter Jen sums it up nicely. He tossed it back, instead of displaying it. And even though it was by far the heaviest thing I ever caught, he doesn't record the weight, so there isn't even any proof I caught it. Your only reward for the staggering effort is 50 measly rupees that you almost certainly don't need. And then the attendant does indeed throw the damn thing back, with no record of you having bagged the loach. The game says it's because they're endangered, but presumably it's really because Nintendo didn't think anyone would actually bother doing this, and so in turn didn't bother to program a fish tank big enough to hold the Hylian loach. To be fair, there probably wasn't much time after programming the attendant's hat to be stealable. Four hours ago, that probably would have seemed really funny. In 
Cindy Darling Binding of Isaac was a Flash game, until it wasn't because Flash Player was made obsolete, and now those Flash animation courses I did when I was 13 are completely worthless. Still, this dark 2011 PC roguelike was a hit and has amassed a huge following, later coming to consoles so that even more people can run around as Isaac, facing weird creatures in procedurally generated dungeons. It has a main story players can blast through in a dozen hours or so, but also features lots of hard to unlock achievements for completionists to sink their teeth into. This can take dozens upon dozens of hours, and if you manage to tick everything off the to-do list, you got one very special achievement, as noted by commenter Galkaif. Binding of Isaac Rebirth. After getting all 402 other achievements, you get the last one called 1 million percent that is just a picture of a stop sign with the description, just stop. Indeed, get every other achievement and you're rewarded with the game telling you to stop playing it, signified with a large piece of paper on the screen with that same information scrawled onto it. Look game, you're the one that gave us a to-do list. And that list is long. 402 things to do is a lot of things to do, but players can tick them off in all three save files in the game to get a fancy 3 million percent screen. However, we'll never see that for ourselves as the game told us to stop. So, um, ice cream anyone? <laughs> The contraction N mm, is often a sign of a good time. Rock and roll, chip N mm, Dale. You just had to ruin it, didn't you, ghosts and goblins? Because this 1985 platformer developed by Capcom is famously difficult. You play a knight called Sir Arthur whose armor will only sustain one hit before it flies off, leaving him in his boxer shorts. Which would only be a problem if Arthur was up to his waist in evil creatures trying to kill him, which he is. And so, even progressing past the very first level in this hellish game is a spectacularly tricky feat. You'd think the game would treat you respectfully if you managed to finish it then, but no, as commenter Hudson Ball points out. Ghosts and goblins, you go through hell and back just to complete the game, only to be forced to play the game all the way through again, but on a higher difficulty, if that was even possible. You might not believe it possible, but it is. If you manage to battle all the way to the final boss encounter and win, instead of having the decency to give you the end credits and a redemption code for a free stress ball, Ghosts and Goblins tells you nothing you've done so far counted. Because this room is an illusion and a trap devised by Satan. Right. In a clear mockery of your enormous effort thus far, the game then starts again, but this time on a higher difficulty. Well, ghosts and goblins, I'm sick and tired of your bullshit. So those are yet more games that mocks you for trying, but you know what? We're not going to do that. We, we appreciate you too much. You got to the end of this video and you deserve a reward. Thank you. Hey, if you really, really liked this video what we would appreciate even more is if you gave us a thumbs up and if you haven't already subscribed if you subscribe that would be great um, and you know what your reward for finishing is even more wonderful videos from us and the opportunity to join our patreon where you have the reward of joining our discord and asking us as many questions as you'd like on there and uh, just thanks for watching we, we, we really appreciate you we treasure you so much thanks